might be sad, but as long as I'm in his presence, I'm okay. And so this week, if you can come out this week, tomorrow, we're going to look at cosmic, the cosmic battle of my family. And during this week, we're going to have a great time. It's not a week where, you know, we're going to be talking about communications and those kind of, no, 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 we've gone past that. All right, we've gone past it. We're going to be talking about serious, serious matters that, 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 that you don't know you're facing. So we're going to be here this week. Tomorrow evening we'll be here. Uh, hope you'll come. Amen. Amen. You promise to be here? Wouldn't keep you long each evening. Um, so be here. Now, th this week I struggled to put this message together. I just got some notes here to guide me. I struggled to put this, 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 these notes together and to, to, uh, to get ready for this series. I've, I've known about this series ages ago, but I, I, I've been thinking about it and to uh, praying about it and crying to God. And every time I go to prepare this, this, this message for this week, I just start to cry. I don't know why. Every time I took the pen and paper to write, I, 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 just, I, just, I just cried, and I don't know why. So I just got some notes, but I believe God is here. Amen? Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We pray that as we navigate through this, this message this morning, this afternoon, you will help us to get to the place that you would have us to be. Now let the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, and O oh Lord, may, in the name of Jesus, may it be acceptable to you. For you are my rock, my salvation, and my all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to let you know that the devil has one aim, one ambition. His, his, his aim, his, his desire is to ensure that you and I don't make it to the kingdom. Did you know that? The devil has one aim, his, his, his one desire, his one desire, his one desire is that you and I don't make it to the kingdom. His, his aim is that your children, your, your sons and your daughters, your, 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 your aunts, your uncles, your parents, his desire is that we don't make it to the kingdom. So what he does, he sets in traps and he puts in strategies. He, he makes his, he, he devises all kinds of things just to make it so that you and I will not enter the kingdom of God. So I want to let you know that you and I are engaged in a war. A war in our minds, a war around us, all around us. We and I are engaged in a warfare and the warfare is not an ordinary warfare. The enemy is engaged with us and it's a, it's a battle. And his desire is that you and I will be lost. Did you know that? Did you know that? So let me just ask you, how many of you here this morning want to be in the kingdom of God? I do. I do. Uh, God, God, Moses, Moses, Moses said to Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh, I, I, God say that I should come to you and ask you to let his people go. Pharaoh says no. He says no. Moses said that Pharaoh, God sent me to you. And he said I should ask you to, to tell you and tell you. He said I'm going to ask you. He said I should tell you. Let my people go. But Pharaoh refused. And I came a point there. And Mo, uh, uh, Pharaoh said to Moses, okay, you can go. But, but, but leave your sons and leave, leave, leave your family behind and go. Moses said, oh no, Pharaoh. He says, we will go. But we will go with our, uh, our sons. and We will go with our daughters. We will go with everything we have. This morning I've come to tell you and challenge you that you and I must fight and fight so hard that we will not leave our children, we will not leave our families, but all together we will strive and fight to the kingdom of God. This morning I want to talk very directly from the word of God. Good to see you, Elder Eric. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. First, Second Corinthians. I want, to come, I want you to come with me into 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Hallelujah. You, you brought the Bible this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 3. Verse 3 says, 
For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Did you get that? For though, verse 3, I want you to underline verse 3. For, for though we, we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Well, the word is saying that you and I are engaged in a kind of a warfare. You and I are engaged in a kind of a warfare. And verse 4 says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, and casting down, verse 5, imaginations every high and high and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I'm going to try to dissect those two verses this morning. Now, the word stronghold, stronghold, stronghold is used both in both Old and New Testament. In the Old Testament, the word stronghold is used about 50 times. And in the New Testament, it's used about once. And in the Old Testament, the word stronghold makes reference to God's protection. It makes reference to God defending his people. It makes reference to God protecting his people. God putting a shield around his people. God being the defender and protector. Every time the word stronghold is used in the Old Testament, it makes reference to God defending his people. It makes reference to God exalting his people, being the protector, defender of his people. So every time his people are faced with problems, they know that God becomes their protector. So this morning, I don't know about you, but, but, but I've allowed God to be my protector. He's my protector. When I am in problem, I allow him to be my protector. God becomes the protector of his people in time of trouble. So did he get that? In the Old Testament, the word stronghold make reference to God being the protector of his people. In Psalm 27 and verse 1, David says, The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold. So what David is saying is that God becomes his defender. God becomes his protector. The Lord is the protector, the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord for whom he is, was, is the stronghold for his people. In 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 22, 1 to 2, the word says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. The word used, brothers and sisters, for fortress is misgaf. The word says misgaf. Misgaf means refuge. Are you hearing me this morning? Those of you who came to church this morning don't know who to turn to, don't know where to go. The word says that misgaf means refuge, means stronghold. It comes from the Hebrew word meaning to be too strong for to be too strong for are you following me amen, amen. that comes from the hebrew word meaning to be too strong for to be lofty to be exalted to lift high to protect to be kept safe. Every time the word fortress is used, it makes reference to stronghold. In other words, in other words, God who is your fortress, God who is your protector, God who is your stronghold becomes, becomes too strong for the enemy to defend. Too strong for the enemy to defeat. God becomes your protector. God becomes your stronghold. God becomes too strong for. So therefore, if God becomes your fortress, if God becomes your protector, it means that when, when, when you are faced 
with problems and the enemy comes to fight you or to defeat you, the Bible says you become too strong for. When he comes to disturb you and to bring problems in your family. The word says because God becomes your fortress, because God becomes your protector, here is what the devil sees. He knows that you are too strong for. He knows that you are kept safe. Why? Because God is your protector. God is your stronghold. God is your defender. So in the Old Testament, when the word stronghold is used, it makes reference to God being your fortress. But you know in the New Testament, it's the converse. There's a flip side. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I want you to know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and verse 5, God is not the only stronghold available to the children of the kingdom of God. I hope you follow me this morning. In the, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, God becomes a stronghold for his people. He becomes the protector and defender for his people. But in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, the stronghold, the stronghold we see there moves from God being your protector to a different definition altogether. What does it mean in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5? Here a stronghold takes on a different meaning. What does it mean? It means anything, any argument, any mindset that sets itself against God. <laughs> in the New in the Old Testament, the word stronghold means one who is your protector, one who is your defender, one who is your fortress, one who becomes too strong for you become too strong for the enemy to fight against you. You become too high and exalted in God for the enemy to wage war against you. But in the New Testament, stronghold takes a new meaning. It takes a new meaning. It takes a new meaning. It becomes a mindset. It becomes an attitude problem that sets itself against God. The word strongholds in the New Testament is anything or argument that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Stronghold in the New Testament is anything that exalts itself in our minds against God. So this morning, what is it that you have set in your mind? What is it that you have set in your lives that is, that is highly against God, against the knowledge of God, against God's plans for your life? What is it in your life that becomes a stronghold that is no longer a protector for you, but has become a, it has become become something? It's become something that has set itself against God. The stronghold is any incorrect, incorrect thinking pattern. Stronghold is any ongoing situation in the life that is contrary to the will of a living and caring God and his plans for your life. So take an inventory of the word stronghold in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 and verse 5. Anything in my life, anything in my life that is contrary to the will of a loving God Anything in my life that is contrary to the will of a caring God and his plans for my life. That's number one. Number two, stronghold is anything that stands as a barrier between me and God. 
Number three, a stronghold is anything that distracts from and destroys my spiritual potential. So each one of you, listen to me, in Old Testament, you become too strong for the enemy. In the Old Testament, you become too highly lifted up because the enemy cannot touch you. But in the New Testament, it is a mindset that set itself against God. So instead of you fighting a battle uh, against the enemy, you turn around and you become against God. So a stronghold is anything in my life that is a barrier between God and his plans for my life. A stronghold is anything that distracts from and destroys my spiritual potential. So you have, in the Old Testament, God is giving you spiritual potential that when you pray, things should happen. God says, I've given you the, the ability, the power, that when you pray over your children, miracles will happen. But because you have set your mind against me in certain parts of your life, when you pray, your prayers are not answered. He says, I've given you potential that when you speak words, when you, when you pronounce things to happen, miracles should happen. Mountains should move when you pray. The sick shall receive healing when you pray. But because you set your mind against me, because there is something in your life that has distracted you, my plans for your life, you become an obstruction. So what is that stronghold? Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, verse 3, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. He says in verse 5, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Anything in my life that prevents me from experiencing life more abundantly. Some of you here this morning, you came to church and somebody is distracting you. God brought you here for a reason. There's something in your life this morning, something in my life this morning that is contrary to the will of God and his plans for your life and my life. There's something in our lives this morning that is a barrier, serving as a barrier, protecting God from, from doing what he has to do in our lives. Something in our lives this morning that distracts from and, and destroys your spiritual potential, the power that God has given to you because of the stronghold in me. I cannot experience the power and potential that God has given me. So what is a stronghold? Well, let me describe a few to you this morning. Anger. Anger. I went to see a lady and she was telling me how angry she is. So I said, who, who are you angry with? She said, I'm angry with my mother. So I said to her, what did she do to you? Oh, Pastor, I can't begin to tell you. It's a long story. But I said to her, when did she anger you? Pastor, 27 years ago. How long? 27 years ago, she says. The anger has taken, has taken root. And the root, the roots have spread out. The anger grew so badly that it grew roots and the roots penetrated the soil of her heart and her life that you could see the anger on her face. Anger. Some of you here this morning, somebody done something to you and, and you're still carrying it. And you're here this morning. Some of you are angry because somebody done something horrible and terrible to you and you, you, you're carrying the, the anger and that anger has grown branches. It grown all kinds of fruit, green fruit, black fruit, purple fruit. Anger is one. Another one, 
related to anger, bitterness. Bitterness. Are you hearing me? We're talking about strongholds. We're talking about things that distract from and destroy your spiritual potential. God says, when you God says you ought to be, you ought to be somebody that I've given power to. to when you speak, miracles should happen. But instead, he says, your spiritual potential, our spiritual potential is dead. Why? Because of the strongholds in our lives. Number one, anger. Number two, bitterness. Somebody see you, you're bitter. And you know, bitterness. It's related to anger. You become angry with somebody. The anger grew. It grows and it turns to bitterness. And that bitterness has the ability to grow roots. And that roots, those roots of that tree of bitterness spreads like a desert cactus. You know desert cactus? It's that plant that grows in the desert, only in the desert. And it has roots to penetrate the soil. The roots are long. They penetrate the desert. Can you imagine the desert cactus? Your anger represents the plant, the desert cactus. In the desert, it has roots that can penetrate the soil. and It, gro it grows everywhere looking for water to drink. And during the summer weather, when the sun is hot, the desert cactus doesn't die. That anger, that bitterness doesn't die. It doesn't matter what happens to you. Come to church, the bitterness is still there. Pray meaning, bitterness is still there. Uh, pray and fasting, bitterness is still there. It's like a desert cactus. Nothing kills it. And the desert cactus, because the bitterness had grown so badly, it put wrinkles on our faces. And you, you, are, you, are, you are 25 and there's gray hair everywhere. Why? Bitterness and anger is growing roots in your life. The strongholds in your life taking hold of you from enjoying the blessings that God has for your life and for your family. And you know, anger and bitterness have the capacity to generate. It generates from your generation to the next generation. And it has the ability to multiply from that generation to the other generation. And has the ability not only to multiply, but to multiply times multiply and multiply to the future generation. Oh, we, we don't, we don't, uh, my family, there's something in my family that it runs down from my grandfather to my father to my, my, my uncle. It runs down. Why? Because that family enjoys anger and bitterness in one another, amongst one another. Anger, bitterness. Oh, you didn't, you didn't expect me to talk about this today, did you? St strongholds, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5, he says, casting down every imagination that exhausts itself against God, bitterness, anger, inability to forgive. That's another one. Anger, bitterness, inability to forgive. You, can't, you don't have the ability to forgive people who angered you, who do bad things to you. She said, Pastor, 27 years now, I, for, I haven't forgiven my mother. 27 years, you haven't forgiven your mother? Anger, bitterness, inability to forgive. Here's another one. Here's another one. Stronghold. Here's another one. Lord have mercy. A stressful marriage. Did you get that? Oh, Lord. No family doesn't respond. Ha! Ha! Woo! 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 Stressful marriage. From day one, it been. In fact, before you got married, it was stressful. Before it happened, you were stressed out. You think, oh, it's going to go away. No, it doesn't go away. You're in it, you're stressed, time stress. And every morning you wake up, you're stressed. During the day, you're stressed. In the evening, you're stressed. Night time, you're stressed. Stress for marriage. It destroys your spiritual potential. It becomes a stronghold. Uh, it's true. See me? See me? Let me, let me switch to my African mood now. You see me? 
appreciate as it is. Yeah, I can't, I can't hide it. Me, I don't hide it. I tell it as I it is. Tell it as it is. Straight for man. Hey. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. hey, hey. hey, hey. My God. That's... Stress for man. Here's another one. Pride. P-R-I-D-E, pride. There's, there's some of us. There's some of us. Listen to me. There's some of us. God is too good to even talk to us. God has no space. The Holy Spirit has no space in your life. You're so proud and pompous that not, nobody can even talk to you. You're too high and mighty. Nobody can make sense to you. God himself can't even speak to you. Stronghold of pride. I know something. That kind of pride is inconsistent with the children of God. You can be the most eloquent. You can be the most sophisticated. You can be the most gifted Seventh-day Adventist, the most knowledgeable Adventist. But if there is pride in your heart, my friend, I've come to tell you that you will not see the kingdom of God. We have to get rid of that stuff. We have to break that stuff. We have to throw that stuff away. We have to expose that stuff. Pride. Sinful pride will have no place in the kingdom of God and is inconsistent with the character of a Seventh-day Adventist. You're Adventist, go and check yourself. Anger, bitterness, inability to forgive, a stressful marriage, pride, envy. Envy. You know the word envy? E-N-V-Y. Envy. Everybody has it, so you too have to have it. Everybody has it, so you too, uh, you, you don't have the money, you know. You don't have it. Just imagine that. You don't have the money to go and pay for it, but you go and take out a loan. Why? Because you, she, me, I will have that. I got to have it. And, and, and the envy can, can, can take you to a dangerous place. When God blesses somebody with a gift, you don't have to be envious because that person has that particular gift. You don't have to be envious. You have your own gift that is unique to you. Anger, bitterness, inability to forgive, a stressful marriage, pride, envy. Here's another one. Here's another one. This one is, this one is like a Tom Cruise. Yes, a Tom Cruise missile. That is, you don't hear it? You must read the news, man. Yes, man, Trump. So I come and say you didn't know it. This one here, this one is a, is a, is a Tom Cruise. Listen to it. You know what this one's called? This one is called, here it is. It's simple, but it's powerful. Discouragement. You know what it does? Listen to me. Because, listen to me, stronghold. Because there is some defect in your character. Because there is some 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 past mistake you've made, some wrong choice, some wrong decisions you've made in your past, you have not been able, you have not been able to forgive yourself, to move on. It has discouraged you to the point that you don't believe God has power to save you and to rescue you and to forgive you from your past. So I went to a shopping mall one day, Croydon, and I was, maybe I told this story before, I, was, I, I came to the shopping mall. Now, when I go to shopping malls, ladies and gentlemen, I don't go with my wallet. <laughs> In fact, I don't carry money with me. Barbara will tell you. I she always says to me, yes, she is. Tell, ask her, she'll tell you. I don't carry money. She always, you always broke. You don't, you don't like to carry money. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. Uh, that's why I'm a pastor, you know, we, we are. So I went to the shopping mall in Croydon and I, and I, I saw this sister coming towards me and, and, I, and I, I saw her crying and, and smiling at the same time. I don't know what she was crying for. I got closer to her and, and, and then I said to her, 
I said, hi. She said, hello to me. She said, oh, I know you. I, you preached a sermon so and so time many, many years ago. I didn't even remember the sermon that I preached. She said, oh, yeah. I said, I said but why are you crying? Why are you, why are you crying, sister? She said, she said to me, my life has come to the place. She said, I'm so discouraged. I said, why? She said, I've done something terrible to God all these years. And, and, and she said, I'm so discouraged. God has not forgiven me all these many years. And I'm so discouraged. And she said, I bought these things. And I bought, it, bought these things because I'm going to end my life. She said, she saw this, I'm so discouraged, Pastor. She said, my life is a mess. She said, I'm so discouraged. I said, yeah. I said, Lord, what should I tell this girl? Then the text came to me in 1 John, uh, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Something that just recited to her. I said to her, I said, sister, do you know? I didn't know what to say. The Spirit gave me the, I said, do you know 1 John 1 and verse 9? She said, yes. She said, what is that going to do for me? I said, listen, that verse is divided into two parts. One part of that verse belongs to you. The other part belongs to God. The one that belongs to you says, I said to her, that one that belongs to you says, if we confess our sins. So I turned to her. I said, sister, I don't know what it is. I don't know what you've done how many years ago. I don't know the color of it. I don't know how to describe it. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what color it has. I don't know what clothes it's wearing. I don't know the mask on his face. But I've come to tell you, it doesn't matter what it is. God says, if. I said to her, have you confessed your, what it is? She said, yes. But I said, then I said to her, I said, all you have to do, my sister, is just do what this text says. This part, he says, all you have to do, just confess. And I said to her, God will take care of the rest. Discouragement. She left smiling and said, thank you. Discouragement is a stronghold. Here's another one. Here's another one. Oh, Lord, I have 12. How much time we have? Here's another one. Bad temper. Vengeance. Sexual loss of pornography, depression, selfishness, lying, gossip, homosexuality. Yeah, go and tell them I said so. Shame. These are strongholds in the life of a Christian that will distract you and destroy your, destroy your spiritual potential. And these strongholds will prevent you from experiencing the life. That God will have you to enjoy. But listen to the text now. Listen to the text. Oh Lord, have mercy. I'll let you go shortly. Hi. Verse 4. Now, I wish I had time to talk a little bit more. Verse 3. But verse 4 says, listen, it says, For the weapons of our warfare. Stop, stop, stop. Stop. For the weapons of our war. Wait, hold on, Paul. You are saying we, we walk in the flesh, but we're not war after the flesh. So we're in a war. Okay? It's a warfare. All right. Verse 4. Then you say, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but those weapons, they are mighty. Huh? All right, let's stop a little bit. What are those weapons? Well, I've listed some of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Weapon number one. Weapon number one. He says that the weapons are what? How does he describe them? He said the weapons are what? No, no, no. Verse five. He said the weapons, what descriptive words he gave to them? The weapons are mighty. Don't miss that. Yes. He says, the weapons of our warfare are mighty. Oh, man. You know, he put that, that conjunction, but he said, the weapons of our warfare is not carnal, not. Then he says, but those weapons, those weapons that we are fighting with, 
that can allow you to pull down the strongholds that I've just listed, that can allow you to break down, to give you back your joy, to give you back your happiness, to give you back your peace, to give you back your victory, to give you back the strength, to give you back prayer power. He says they are mighty. Well, weapon number one. You won't believe this. Weapon number one. That are mighty. Here's the first one. Praise and worship. So in the morning, I call my family together. Whether you're a single parent or whether you're just on your own parent. You come together. You come into God's presence and you begin to sing that old song. Lord, in the morning thou shalt hear my voice. Then I to thee will I direct my prayers. To thee lift up my... Wait, 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 wait there. Wait, 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 wait. Listen, listen to this. He says, he says, praise and worship. But Augustus, how can praise and worship become a weapon? Oh, how can praise... When me alone in the room by myself and my strongholds are raging and I don't seem to understand what's going on and you telling me the weapons of your warfare, the weapons of my warfare are mighty and you telling me praise and worship? Yes. Here's what it says. Psalm 149. He. He. Hi. He says Psalm 149. Praise and worship is one of the weapons. He says the weapons... Here's one of the weapons, praise and worship. He says, Psalm 149, praise ye the Lord. Sing, Psalm 149, verse 1, praise ye the Lord. Yes? Sing unto the Lord a what? A new song. That song that you, can, you alone know. You, you, you alone know. And his praise in the... Oh, come on, you guys, turn with me. Psalm 149, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new, the Lord a new song. And his praise in the congregation of his saints. Let North Wembley rejoice in, in whom? In him that made him. Let North Wembley be joyful in their king. Verse 3. Let North Wembley praise his name in the dance. Let North Wembley sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Now, listen to this now. Let the saints be joyful in, 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 in glory. Let them sing aloud upon the beds. Verse 6. Let the high praise of God be in their mouth. You see that? So, so, oh, so every time you engage in pray. Prayer, uh, praise and worship. Every time you put into your mouth praise and worship, here's what happens. It says, verse 6, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in the hand. So, oh, yeah. Where's the timbre? Give me something. So, the high presence of God in there, mouth. in the mouth, and a what? A two-edged sword yeah. in the hand. So every time you engage in praise and worship, you become a weapon. You become a weapon that the devil, the enemy, is afraid of. So every time you praise and you worship, you take into your hands the word of God and your pronouncements words that you utter words that you, you pronounce become mighty they perform miracles sick people receive healing stressed people receive hope that's why God says his people ought to praise because every time we praise we fight the war every time we praise we get the enemy of strength Praise and worship is a weapon in the hands of God's people. Weapon number two. Weapon number two. Ah, you know when Paul and Silas were in prison? 
Acts chapter 16. The Bible says, you know, when we're in prison, Acts chapter 16, I believe it is. When they were in prison, Paul and Silas, when they were in prison, they, they could have fought, you know. You know, but the Bible says, it says, Acts chapter 16. It says that, that Paul and Silas, now these guys in prison for whatever reason, you know. Verse 22, verse 25 says, at midnight, Paul and Silas, they did what? Prayed and sang what? Praises unto God. So, listen now. So, the little prayer meeting they had in the prison, you know what they had the capacity to do? Remember now, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, verse 4 says that the weapons of our warfare, they are mighty through God. Mighty. So, their praise and worship in verse 25, when they prayed and they prayed, sang praises to God, the Bible says in verse 26, there was a great earthquake. So, listen now. Listen. When you and I pray, and we praise, our prayers and our praises, doesn't matter how discouraged you are, they become so powerful that they take down, that they have an effect on the environment. You don't understand, because you don't believe it. That's why, that's why the Adventist church, we are like the way we are. We fuss, we curse, we know it all. We know everything. We know everything. We fight on the church board. We fight in the church. We fight in our families. We pray two minutes, microwave prayer, and we expect God to perform nothing. No, listen. Oh, don't fool yourselves. Let me talk to the Jamaican way now. No, it doesn't happen like that. The Bible says these guys pray. They pray fervently. Seasonly press on their knees, they, 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 they cry to God. When was the last time you cried to God? You, when the last time you cried and you felt it in your belly? You were on your knees and the problem was so hard and, and you don't know what to, when was the last time you cried to God? The Bible says when God's people cry to him in praise and worship, God turned the impossible to possible. God make blue to turn red on your behalf. He will move mountains all because of you. Paul and Silas prayed. They prayed and they sang songs so much so that it had an impact on the environment. The Bible says there was an earthquake just because two people decided to pray and sing some songs. Listen, there is power you have and you don't know what to do with it. So we have prayer and, praise and worship, first weapon, number two. The second weapon, prayer, talked about it a while ago. The third weapon, the word of God. The Bible says, uh, Hebrews 4, the the word of God is sharper and powerful than any two edges. So the word of God, God's word, God's word is powerful. You and I must make ourselves, we must read the word and allow the word to penetrate us. It must penetrate our genes. It must penetrate our DNA. It must penetrate our chromosomes that when we speak his words, mountains move. When we speak the words, our family problems turn around. We believe the words so much that when we speak it, strongholds crumble. So praise and worship, number one. Number two, prayer, weapons of our warfare. Isn't that what he says? He said the weapons of warfare are mighty through God. Prayer, prayer and worship, prayer, word of God. Number four, Lord. Number four, the fourth one, the name of Jesus. You get that? The name of Jesus. The weapons of warfare are mighty through God. I'm saying to you, folk, the name of Jesus. When we pray, we must pray in the name of Jesus. That name is a name that is powerful. Devils hear that name and run. That name is able to turn the captives free. That name is able to bring new life. That name can bring new hope. That name can pull down strongholds when a family, when a couple, when a spouse is having problems. I've come to let you know the name of Jesus. 
pray in the name of Jesus over your family. Pray in the name of Jesus over your children. Pray in the name of Jesus over your spouse. The name of Jesus. The weapons of our warfare is mighty through God. Praise and worship, prayer, word of God, the name of Jesus. Number five. The fifth and last one. And I'm close. Now I'm, cl I'm finished. Fifth and last weapon. Oh, Lord. The blood of the Lamb. <laughs> uh, John the Revelator was confused. He said, how did these people overcome? He asked an angel, how did these people overcome? He said, they overcame their problems through the blood of the Lamb. You and I sing that song. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood. Will you, be, will you over the evil, the victory win? There is power. There is power. Power, wonder working power. In the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power. Wonder working power. In the precious blood of the Lamb. I've come to tell you that there is power. In the blood of the Lamb, that power to cleanse, power to heal, power to break down, power to break loose, power to strengthen, power to empower you, power in the Lamb of God. This morning, I've come to tell you that the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. You and I learn, must learn to praise and worship prayer. But learn to pray in Jesus' name. Learn the power of the Lamb of God. Learn the power of the Word of God. I've come to tell you that they're able to break down and break loose the problems in our lives. And help us to live a victorious Christian life. Give us joy. Give us peace. Give us hope. Give us strength. Give us courage, encouragement. Give us victory in our homes. Give us victory in our churches. Give us victory in our lives. Why? Because we learn to understand how to use the weapons of our warfare which is mighty through the pulling down of stronghold. I want to call this morning as we close. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I don't know what. Give me something, Mike. I don't know what's your strongholds this morning. I don't know. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Our hands are bound and eyes are closed. The devil's desire that you don't see God. You don't see his face. You're not saved. That, that's what he wants. He wants to rob you of God giving you the power that so much so you become too strong for the enemy. You become too strong that he is not able to fight you. He, the devil wants to, to destroy you, destroy your family. He wants to take away your, your power, your spiritual strength, your spiritual potential. He wants to take it away. He wants to discourage you. But I've come to tell you this afternoon. That God will help you. And He will help you that right early. If you and I learn to understand that we can overcome through His blood, would you trust Him to do that for you? But you say, Augustus, I have weaknesses in my life, I have battles that I'm struggling with. That's fine. That's fine. Just take it out. Just take it on low. Just slow. Just low. Just low. Just low a little bit. There's mistakes in my life. There's weaknesses in my life. I don't think God can do anything with me. I've come to tell you. I've come to tell you. That is why he gives his Holy Spirit. He gives his Holy Spirit to those who are weak and don't know how to overcome. He gives you his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not for people who are perfect. 
The Holy Spirit is for weak people. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is for people who are struggling with strongholds. The Holy Spirit for those who don't know what to do. The Holy Ghost, hallelujah, is for you if an evil man knows how to give good gifts to his children, how much more your Father in heaven is willing to give you his Holy Spirit to help you, to strengthen you, to empower you, to give you victory. Hallelujah. He can help you. Yes, he can. He helped me. If he could help me, how much more you trust him? Father, you see your people. The tears in their eyes. The sadness on the faces. Because the enemy has robbed us. And it brought in confusion and problems and envies and jealousy and backbiting. Why? Because he doesn't want us to be saved in your kingdom. So he brings in subtly the strongholds in our lives to entrap us and prevent us from experiencing the potential of spiritual strength that will give us victory in you for our families, for our spouses and our children. Lord, he has been so tricky and so deceptive that he has deceived our children. That our children have lost the battle. They've gone on into the kingdom of darkness and into the satanic kingdom and he's destroying our young boys, our young children. Lord, have mercy. The enemy has waged a war. And our young children, our young boys, disobedient to parents, stubbornness of heart, rebellious, these are all strongholds and signs of the enemy taking over our families and our children. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus. We plead his knee. Mighty. Breaking down strongholds. The name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus. Lord, we plunge this morning, this afternoon in the blood of Jesus. Save us. Save a spouse this morning who wants to give up on his family. Save a husband who wants to run away. Save him. Save a wife who's about to give up. Save that young man who is going and getting over and struggling with addiction. Save us. Save us, Lord. Save us. Save us. All of you heads are bowed and I want you to stand where you are. Just stand. Everybody please stand. You understand the eyes are closed. I want you to call to yourself that stronghold that is in your life. That is robbing you of the blessings that God has for your life. Distracting you from experiencing the power that God wants to have over your life. And for you to have over your life. That stronghold in your life, I want you to name it in your mouth. To name it. And 
I want you to exchange it this afternoon for power through the blood of the Lamb. Why not tell God that you have turned it over to Him in exchange for His power? You're turning it over to Him. It's going to be rough, but you're going to turn it over to Him. And He will give you the victory through the weapons which are mighty through God. We help you to pull down the strongholds. And, and you, by His grace of God, you will be obedient to His word. You'll be obedient to Him and see what He will do in your life. See the miracles He will perform in your life. See the mountains allow you to climb. See how you turn it around for you. Turn your darkness into light. He will make crooked things straight. Open doors for you. Why? Because you've turned it over to him. Turn it over. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We turn it over to you now, Lord. We are turning it over. Take it. And do for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do for us, Lord, that only wish you alone can do. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.